Hi, I'm Rajneesh. And I'm Bridget. Welcome to Terrascience. The podcast where reality matters. So Bridget, today we have a special guest. Uh, this is John Farrell. He's the Vice President of Research and Development at uh, Isomite. And Isomite, which I will show you right here, is a company that surface mines volcanic ash. Uh, it's based in Utah. And I've known John for four years, and it's been a pleasure working with him. So John, I'd like to hear um, uh, about you. Tell us about yourself. OK. Hi. How's everyone doing? So yeah, my, yeah, I'm the vice president of research and development and technical services for Azomite Mineral Products. Uh, the company's located in Utah. I am physically located in Indiana. Uh, not, not only do I serve as the the head of R&D for the company, but I also serve as uh, associate administrative professional staff, uh, somewhat like an adjunct at Purdue University. And I serve on some graduate committees at other universities as well to help develop PhD students in both animal sciences and plant sciences. Awesome. So thank you. We're really lucky to, to get to chat to you about uh, Azamite and your work. And um, I was curious a little bit more about how does Azamite work and how do you uh, use it for application purposes? Yeah, so it works in different ways for different applications. And that's kind of the unique thing about uh, the mineral deposit that we do have. The primary pillar of the company is on the animal side, and when we make animal pellets for feed, uh, the product itself is coarse, fairly gritty. Um, it's technically called a dacitic tough brachia, right? So it, that has a lot of meaning to it, but it's not strictly a dacite, but it's classified as a dacitic tough brachia. So, so I, I have some of it here. I just wanted to show yeah. it. This is <laughs> So we take, uh, it is a, a big surface mine. It's approximately 38.6 million years old from an eruption wow. that occurred. Yep, and it's all located in one spot. And we've mm -hmm. done geological surveys around that spot and really haven't found anything else like it but this deposit. Wow. We've also looked at surveys across some geological landscapes across the world and haven't really found much else quite like it based on so its characteristics. That's interesting. Does that mean it's basically like a limited uh, source of it? Uh, it's a big pile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if we were, I think we did one estimate, if we were to feed every uh, animal in our target market and uh, a lot of on our plant agronomy side, we'd have over 300 years of supply. Wow. wow. So yeah, there's quite a bit in the yeah. in the pile that we call yeah. it down at the mine. Um, so it's, it's fairly gritty. It's what's called a vitric tough. It's um, poorly welded together. So as the pyroclastic flow cools and starts to settle, it, it can go through different welding stages, and this one's fairly poorly welded, which also mm -hmm. gives it some microporous properties. So you can pick it up like Raj did, and you can grind it. Um, we just completed a blast at the mine, which was fun. We do a huge <laughs> explosion and blow the face of it wow. off, and then we take it and grind it up into its final grades. Mm -hmm. And what Rajneesh had there was uh, one of our final grades into a finer powder. Gotcha. And we have several of those that go from field grit all the way down to uh, a micronized type of product. Yeah. Yes, and, and so uh, uh, when John and I met about four or five years ago, uh, we, we were just starting our my company, which is iCultivare. And iCultivare, I started that uh, mainly to bridge the gap that exists between industry and academic research. And so what iCultivare does is that it takes uh, manufacturers' products, such as Isomite, and uh, studies how does Isomite work, and is it good for the planet and the plants? And of course, you know, in this research, sometimes we find products which are not good. So we are independent. We, we, we are not attached to any particular product or company. We work, do independent research. And so the idea is to bring this research into universities and uh, collaborate with, um, uh, you know, professional researchers, which I am one as well, and uh, work with graduate students and postdocs. Um, so we started that work about four or five years ago. And just uh, uh, recently, we published our first uh, findings, and and John uh, was involved with the research as well, and so the first findings were pretty uh, exciting. I think, not only we found that azomite increased uh, the weight of tomatoes that we used uh, to to test azomite, but also that azomite uh, shifted the microbes, the bacteria, mm -hmm. inside the roots of the tomato plants. So, um, and um, John, maybe before we get into the plant side, 
uh, we will come back to this. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you've been finding on the animal side. Yeah, so there's two, two aspects for us on the animal side. There's our primary pillar that we call it, which is the strategic throughput for mill efficiency. So we help pellet mills, because of its gritty nature, run more efficiently in producing those pellets. What happens is as it, it goes through the pellet die, it scours and polishes the die channels that the pellets have to pass through. So as feed gets processed through those pellets, starches and other complex can build up. So the grittiness, that's just sheer property of it, the physical property, helps clear that out and we help improve the efficiency of making the feed. The natural aspects or the nature-based aspects of the product itself is that it has over 70 different elements in it. Some in high concentration, some in low, some in rare form. And a lot of these serve as uh, co-processes for physiological reactions that occur in metabolism that we do not account for when we, when we formulate diets. So we know that they're present in other materials as well, but we don't take the initiative to actually formulate down to these types of micro or trace element levels. Right, and, and those, those micro elements, uh, you know, which, which are micronutrients, uh, within the volcanic ash, and volcanic ash is well known to have benefits um, uh, all around the world. Um, and so it, it, it's, uh, it was very easy to think then, then as a next step, to try to use it in agriculture because mm -hmm. it has all these micronutrients. And so it's, it has been used uh, for agriculture for quite a while. And in the past four or five years, we've been trying to understand how does isomite work. And we are finding uh, very interesting aspects of isomide. So it has multiple, like John said, uh, you know, multiple micronutrients, some uh, rare earth elements as well. And so what it appears to be doing is that allowing the plant to take up uh, these uh, elements and micronutrients, and that helps the plant to uh, possibly do more physiological processes. For example, photosynthesis. And we are working towards uh, answering those questions specifically. We, where we think that uh, there is actually a change in gene expression within the plant. So the plant is responding to azomite and adapting to having azomite in its surrounding and then uh, uh, using that to uh, increase its growth. And, and if the plant grows more and does more photosynthesis, then it produces more fruit. And so the paper that we just published, uh, it also shows that uh, when uh, isomite is present, uh, the bacteria that are found inside the roots shifted or were different. We call them core taxa or the core bacteria. And we think the reason they shifted uh, is because the plant was making more sugars. And those sugars were sent down to the roots. And then uh, the plant was able to recruit uh, different types of bacteria. So. Um, this in itself is, is interesting. You know, in, in agriculture, there are many, many products out there. And it's, it's difficult to really know which ones work and which ones don't work. And because many times growers will just add products and it's very hard to really tell whether there was an effect of, of those products or not. So it's important to start looking at uh, microbes and microbiomes and um, the nature of uh, interconnectedness between soil health and plant health. So, uh, so that, that's the exciting part, I think, uh, about this. And we'll put a link to the paper um, uh, in the podcast. So uh, then, you know, another thing, John, maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, carbon sequestration. Because, you know, we, we talk about carbon, which is an important aspect um, of preserving carbon uh, inorganic matter and uh, carbon dioxide, which may be in the air. Uh, and, you know, we, we talk about all the things that can increase CO2 that can cause global warming and everything like that. So it's very important to sequester and absorb this carbon and put it back into organic matter. So, uh, and isomite can do that because if, if we increase biomass and we increase growth of plants, for example, then they sequester carbon. Also microbes that will consume azomite or, or use azo elements in azomite uh, and grow on azomite will also increase organic matter. So carbon sequestration uh, can be promoted by, uh, by volcanic ash. 
Yeah, I think there's, it's quite the hot topic. There's a finite number of ways that we can actually sequester carbon without creating uh, new environments for that to happen. So between plants and soil and sea, uh, there's just only so many ways to capture at the moment without physically creating a mechanism for it to do it. So the more efficiency that we can create in sequestering that and turning it back into natural carbon uh, obviously just helps uh, reduce the carbon footprint pressure that we have and that we continue to, to create. Yeah, and uh, an additional uh, benefit that, that we are studying, um, and you know, we, we are working on four to five other uh, papers uh, in the next two or three years with John, uh, but other things that we're looking at are uh, just improvement of the quality. So when you have these minerals and elements and, and they are uh, more available uh, through microbial activity or uh, to the plant, um, they also become incorporated into pigments and uh, antioxidants, things that, that are important. Uh, that's why, for example, in tomatoes, uh, lycopene uh, and beta carotene, these are pigments. And we think that there's, it's possible that azomite, and because it has these uh, elements, that will increase uh, these pigments, which are antioxidants, and this is why people eat tomatoes. And so it will increase the quality of the tomatoes and will provide better health benefits uh, uh, from growing with, with uh, volcanic ash. So it seems like there's a lot of benefits of using it. Not only if you apply it to your soil, it'll help sequester more carbon, but it'll also have m way bigger nutritional effects for the, the plants having better yields or just healthier food in general. Right. So as we've felt the pressure of the need for increased food supply, you know, it's always been part of my mission to, to be a part of safe, affordable, and abundant food. And sometimes what gets lost in that, and I say sometimes because it's not completely lost, but sometimes along the way we do see a loss of quality of food, mm -hmm. a nutritional quality of food. So if you continue, and it's kind of like a double-edged sword, if you continue losing nutritional qualities of food, you're just simply going to have to eat more food to get the nutritional Right. impact that you want. But if we can increase the nutritional quality of food, uh, not only just the nutrition aspect of it, but shelf life as well, where you can impact the, the overall distribution of the, of the food from low quality to high quality and, and make it more towards a high quality range. And then you can get it into channels where you can feed more people. Then now we've truly made an impact on, on the human condition. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, like I said, uh, I, as I cultivate, we work with, look at many different products. So this certainly is not uh, meant to be an ad or, or commercial for Azomite. Just wanted to share the research that mm -hmm. we've been doing. Uh, and um, I found many aspects of using uh, Azomite or volcanic ash in general, but particularly uh, this one that we are testing because it has uh, rare earth elements. And like John said, each uh, each volcanic ash uh, is diff is going to be different. It will be mm -hmm. dependent upon where, where the volcano was, what was the component, what were the components. And, you know, there are many uh, forms of such types of products. Many of them uh, are absorbent. They can hold water and all of those things. But this one also contains minerals and aspects that, that I think are beneficial. And it's a nat nature-based product. So um, it's, uh, I think it's, it has sustainability aspects to it as well. So it's, it's a really, I think, a good way to think about future of agriculture as we transition from conventional methods. And uh, John, maybe you can tell us about uh, that it is also, uh, can be used for organic agriculture. It of course itself is not organic, but it can be used for organic agriculture. Yeah, sometimes that gets confused. Uh, it is not organic. <laughs> right. uh, it is nature-based. It is surface mined. Um, but it is, uh, being an all-natural product and with no added fillers, uh, very little processing that we do, uh, we are listed on the OMRI as uh, you, uh, suitable for uh, organic production. So gotcha. that okay. is uh, quite a benefit that we, we see, and we're very proud to have that, that mm -hmm. type of listing. So. And, and so it's available internationally. Yeah, we're a small, it's, it's amazing. We're a small company full of good people, uh, but we have a global footprint. And so mm -hmm. we, we do impact quite a bit and we keep growing, which is the fun part of it. So mm -hmm. we hope to bring more people into our Azomite family and expand all of our work uh, and be able to have the benefit that we see 
and our mission touch other people around the world to basically Absolutely. you know increase safe affordable and abundant food so i'm curious again about like the application i'm sure if it's the application's different for whatever it is that you're using it for. But say if it's a, a regular crop of food, is it something that is usually applied once or can you apply it multiple times or every different season that it's needed? Um, I'm not sure if you have all the answers for that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> okay. So it yeah, could be used in all of those different ways. It, it is, and mm-hmm. it, there's, uh, you know, the fun thing about research is you find those intrinsic values that guide mm-hmm. you along the way of how to use for gotcha. implementation and application. Um, so yeah, it depends on the plant uh, that we're doing. So uh, the simple way to think about it: bigger plants need more, smaller plants need yeah. less. Gotcha. Okay. And then it depends on the growth stage of a plant. So what we're finding out mm-hmm. uh, in a plant like tomatoes is that there is benefit to putting it in the pot or in the soil up front, but there's also benefit to come along in the growth cycle at strategic mm. points and, and add just a little bit more. Yeah. But it's, it's very easy to use and safe to use. The product itself being what it is, um, it will not dissolve in water. It will go through some dissolution, uh, but not disassociation. Okay, so, but what that means is that you can, uh, at the finer grade, you can suspend it in water if you wanted to and then you could broadcast it that way. Or you could broadcast it dry, or you could target placement in furrow, or you could target place on top of the ground. There's just a lot of ways that you could go about uh, of applying it. But it gets used in everything from uh, home gardens and mm-hmm. flower pots, all the way to um, you know large tree farms, for instance. And awesome. then on the animal side, it gets used a lot in the uh, food animal meat production area. So it gets put in the feed for its primary aspect of mill efficiency, and then through that, we gain the derived benefits that, that may express themselves along the way. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's great. So there are m- many different applications and uh, it, it seems to have uh, lots of benefits. And like John was saying, it, it, it is sort of silicon based, so it is more like sand, so it doesn't dissolve. Mm-hmm. But uh, it can, I think some people have applied it through irrigation systems. So as long as it's uh, suspended, it can be applied through irrigation. Gotcha. Um, and also, uh, when we test it, we just apply it close to the roots uh, around the plant, uh, where the plant and the soil kind of meet, you know, in that area. Uh, and it's a powder, mm-hmm. and it stays there, uh, especially in greenhouse and parks. Uh, on the field, uh, maybe, uh, may, you know, a little bit more application may be needed, because uh, it may not, uh, it may uh, move away from from the area a little bit more. So, so John, so this is this is great, and you know I'm I'm looking forward to continuing our research. And uh, typically, you know, uh, it, this stuff takes a while. <laughs> so, and we'll ho- we're planning to do gene expression analysis to see what kinds of genes may come on within the plants in response to azomite. So, there, there's be lots of uh, exciting uh, findings in the coming uh, year and two. Uh, but if people are interested in azomite, how can they get it? Oh, uh, pretty simple. So we go to uh, the Azomite website, and for the international customers, there's an Azomite International website, and there's contact information to contact the, the company directly uh, at that page. Thank you oh, very great. much for sharing yes. all of this about Azomite and also introducing yourself to, to Terra Science as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you guys for listening. Please give us a like and subscribe if you can. Share this video and you can definitely check out Azomite. We will link them in the description below and have a wonderful rest of your day.